This video has been funded through an educational grant by Sanofi Limited. Sanofi has had no input towards the content of the video or the interviews. Cold agglutinin disease is a rare condition affecting between 5 and 20 people per million. As a complement-dependent disorder, it shares many of the hallmarks of an autoimmune condition, but brings with it its own challenges. Professor Sigbjorn Berenson of Horgesund Hospital in Norway spoke with us about the biological underpinnings of cold agglutinin disease and how that translates into patients' symptoms. Cold agglutinin disease uh, is a chronic form of autoimmune hemolytic anemia and autoimmune hemolytic anemia is anemia, low levels of hemoglobin in the blood caused by destruction of the red blood cells by autoantibody to the red blood cells. Autoantibodies are antibodies to one's own cells. Uh, the autoantibodies in cold agglutinin disease are called cold agglutinins, which means that they can agglutinate, that is, clump together red blood cells. Cold agglutinins can bind to red blood cells at temperatures between normal central body temperature. And it's important to know that such temperatures do not occur only in cold environment, but also occur normally uh, in exposed parts of the body, for example, the, the face, the arms, the feet, and so on. Uh, they will also bind uh, a substance called complement, which is a somewhat complex part of the, uh, the immune system. Cold agglutinins and cold agglutinin disease are produced by uh, so-called B lymphocytes or B cells in the bone marrow. Uh, normal B cells are cells uh, parts of uh, the normal immune system, but clonal B cells are slightly abnormal in that all of the clonal cells are alike. They have identical properties, and they are produced. Uh, they are they all descend from one single cell. This slide shows uh, how it will appear for the pathologists when looking in the microscope. And I have tried to, to mark uh, groups of clonal B cells within the bone marrow. And um, when I said that there were abnormal cells in the bone marrow, uh, some people will ask, is this disease a cancer? Is it a malignant disease? And uh, the answer it is that it is not. Um, the, the abnormal cells do not go outside the bone marrow. and uh, transformation, change to a malignant disease is very rare in cold agglutinin disease. And cold agglutinins bind to the red blood cells uh, and the red blood cells will agglutinate, that is clump together. And that agglutination or clumping is not the same as formation of a blood clot. This process will lead to a hemolytic anemia uh, red blood cells will be destroyed and I will come back to how th that will happen and uh, also uh, the agglutinates the small uh, clumps of red blood cells will have problems in the, pas uh, in the passage of the smallest blood vessels the capillaries so uh, there can be what we call circulatory symptoms uh, a bluish discoloration of the nose and face and fingers and feet, uh, in particular in the cold, um, and uh, also what we call Raynor-like symptoms. Uh, and for example, patients may have difficulties in taking uh, food from the fridge, and they, in general, don't tolerate uh, cold temperatures. How do you reach a CAD diagnosis? It is necessary to, to confirm that the patient has that the patient has hemolytic anemia, which is confirmed by by a relatively simple blood tests. Then you need the the, the DAT or so-called direct Coombs uh, to diagnose an uh, autoimmune mechanism uh, to see if the hemolysis uh, is due to an autoimmune disease. And if you confirm that, you also need um, further more specific DAT tests to confirm the type of autoimmune hemolysis. And um, after that, you need uh, to do a cold agglutinin titer 
to detect cold agglutinins in the blood and uh, determine the, the, the quantity. Many patients have detected before they see the specialist that uh, cooling is not good. They notice those symptoms and uh, they notice uh, reduced tolerance to, to uh, cold environments and uh, they have uh, detected uh, some of these points themselves. But um, what patients sh should be explained is that avoidance of cooling is good not only to avoid the circulatory symptoms, the bluish discoloration, etc., but also um, to reduce the danger of uh, severe hemolysis. I try to educate patients uh, about avoid avoiding cooling and uh, especially of avoiding cooling of the extremities and face. Uh, but uh, it's uh, even important to educate uh, healthcare personnel because when patients are in a hospital or in an outpatient department, uh, they should not be exposed to low temperatures. And for example, infusions should not be cold. So that's important uh, too. About one fourth of the patients with cold gluten disease have severe anemia. If we define severe as uh, a hemoglobin level between eight grams per deciliter or 80 grams per liter, uh, as it also is, is called. Um, one third or somewhat more have a moderate hemolytic anemia, a hemoglobin level between eight and 10 grams per deciliter. Uh, about one fourth have a mild anemia, an anemia with a hemoglobin level more than 10, and a small minority, uh, about 10 or 12 percent, have what we in medical terms call compensated hemolysis. That is, they have hemolysis, but they have not anemia because the bone marrow is able to compensate by producing more red blood cells. Uh, so uh, what should trigger treatment in terms of hemolytic anemia? Uh, there is no definite trigger, but uh, I think all patients with severe or moderate hemolytic anemia should be treated. And uh, some patients with mild hemolytic anemia um, dependent on uh, additional symptoms. Additional symptoms may, for example, be fatigue, which is caused not only by, uh, by, by the anemia by, uh, by itself, but also um, by activation of the complement system. Uh, patients with disabling uh, cold-induced symptoms from the circulation, for example, those who can't take uh, food from the fridge and other patients um, in whom the circulatory symptoms uh, affects uh, daily living, should also be offered a treatment. So uh, that's the best answer I can give on whom should be, be treated. Uh, I think today about 80% of patients with cold gluten disease will need treatment. So in old literature, it was often said that most patients should not be treated, but uh, that's not true today. What treatment options are there? Treatment can be directed at targeting the, the, patho uh, the, the abnormal B-cell clone or the complement system. And uh, the B-cell clone can be targeted by uh, monotherapy with a drug called rituximab that is an artificially uh, produced antibody against uh, the B-cells. Uh, and we can use rituximab as monotherapy. Uh, the advantage by doing that is that it is tolerated by most patients. Um, severe side effects are uh, relatively rare, um, but the, the drawbacks are that it's not very efficient. Um, it often um, improves, the, improves the disease for a short time, uh, often some months, up to one year. Uh, and uh, it is often uh, not very efficient. Uh, so we can combine the rituximab with cytotoxic drugs, for example, bendamustine. Uh, that's far more efficient. 
and produces uh, much more durable improvements of the disease, but there are more side effects. Uh, then we can also use a drug called potesumib, and uh, we can also use a newer drug called ibrutinib to target the, the B cells. Alternatively, as I already said, we can try to target the complement activation by using a complement inhibitor, a, a drug that blocks complement activation. That drug is called sutimlimab and has to be given as an intravenous infusion uh, every second week. Uh, the, the advantages of sutimlimab is that, uh, that it is very efficacious against the hemolytic anemia. Patients often achieve a normal hemoglobin level very rapidly. Um, the drawbacks with sutimlimab is first that it is extremely expensive not available in all countries and in some some countries not available for all patients uh, and uh, also um, sutimlimab will not uh, improve the cold induced circulatory symptoms the 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 bluish discoloration and the uh, rain or light, light symptoms in the cold will not be um, alleviated by by um, sutimlimab so the patients will, will still experience those symptoms from the circulation. In countries with a well-functional specialized hematology service, uh, wrong medical treatment should not be very frequent. But uh, on a worldwide basis, it, it is. Uh, and uh, the most uh, widespread wrong treatment is treatment with uh, corticosteroids. Uh, prednisone and prednisolone and so on. It doesn't work in cold agglutinin disease. It's uh, often used by some doctors because it works in other types of autoimmune hemolytic anemia, but it should not be used in cold agglutinin disease. So that's an example of, of, uh, of wrong medical treatment. How are trials changing access to new treatments? Patient uh, contribution uh, will be uh, will be preferred uh, when planning trials. So, for example, in in uh, in the US, uh, the CAD Foundation uh, might be consulted when planning clinical trials, and I think input from the patients uh, will be important because they know how they perceive the the disease and uh, and uh, what are the unmet needs. We don't still have the ideal treatment for cold gluten disease. We are uh, much better off than 10 years ago and very much better off than 20 years ago, but we haven't yet the ideal treatment. So clinical trials are important. And uh, I would encourage patients to participate, participate in clinical trials. Do other health complications such as infections pose a different risk to those with CAD than without? Yes, it's important, and that is because infection, and in particular infection with fever, can trigger exacerbations, worsenings, acute worsenings of, of cold gluten disease. So patients can get more anemic, uh, destroy more red blood cells, and um, therefore patients should be aware that uh, if they get fever, they should see the, the doctor and uh, the infection should be diagnosed. And uh, of course, uh, it's not uh, possible to treat all infections. For example, in most viral infections, there is no treatment, but uh, bacterial infections can be treated and prompt uh, treatment of bacterial infections is important to avoid exacerbations, worsenings of cold agglutinin disease of the hemolytic anemia. Of course, there are some consequences. I think, after all, uh, the most important consequences are the consequences of uh, anemia by itself. Patients do not feel well. They are fatigued. fatigued. They have fatigued uh, also because of the complement activation by itself. In particular, if the patient has severe anemia and need transfusions, um, there may be a danger of iron overload in the long run. Uh, 
that danger is not very big, but it is there for some patients uh, who need transfusions. And uh, the best way to avoid that risk is to treat the patients for colidogluten disease. And uh, patients with colidogluten disease also have some risk of uh, thrombosis of formation of blood clots in the veins or in the lungs. Uh, that risk is not very uh, high in the chronic phase of the disease. It uh, may be higher during acute worsenings of the disease. So in some situations, uh, patients may need drugs to avoid um, thrombosis, but in the chronic phase, uh, most patients do not need such drugs. What are your final thoughts on CAD and its care? One of the misconceptions uh, is that uh, the disease is only uh, related to, to, to cold environments. It isn't. It's named cold agglutinin disease because the autoantibodies are most active below normal central body temperatures. But the disease is not only related to cold environments. In patients with cold agglutinin disease, the disease is there all the time, whether it is warm and cold uh, around you. Another misconception uh, is that uh, patients should usually not be treated. I would say the opposite. Patients should usually be treated. Uh, some patients do not need treatment uh, in, uh, with very mild disease, but most patients will need to be treated. But if a general practitioner has a a particular patient with cold agglutinin disease. Of course, he or she should educate himself. Um, then, uh, at the specialist level, patients with cold agglutinin disease should be seen by a hematologist. They should undergo an, uh, a sufficient diagnostic workup. And uh, if the hematologist, uh, if the hematologist is um, not familiar with cold agglutinin disease, um, he or she should uh, refer the patients to, to a hematologist who is. Um, and uh, as I said, some patients with colidogluten disease do not need treatment, but most patients should be treated and treatment, sh treatment should be tailored according to uh, the profile of the symptoms of the patient um, and also patients should be asked for their preferences.